Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, those of you who are here early, you get extra extra credit. Okay, thanks. This is a this is a yearly event. The second this is the second part of a two day event. For the first time we've uh, had it over two days. The first day was in Portland yesterday, uh, where Peter Lawler moderated a uh, uh, what, several panels, right? Or just one? We we had. Uh, Harris broadcasting live, and then a panel discussion with Lars Larson and Harry Phillips debated the question why talk radio skews right, and then we had a fine panel discussing that later on. That was, you know, I mean, yesterday would have been, you know, why talk radio skews right. They probably had a much more lively discussion uh, <laughs> with talk radio hosts, but we'll do our best. Uh, some of us here have actually been on radio, others would rather stay away from. Um, so good morning, I'm Tom Bivens, uh, I'm the John L. Holting Chair in Media Ethics uh, at the School of Journalism and Communication, and this event is, uh, is named in the honor of John Holting. It's the Halting Conversations in Ethics, and as I just said, this has been a two-day process. Uh, today we have two panels, beginning with uh, the first panel this morning, well, which is uh, composed of people who are both professionals and academics uh, to address a single question. Uh, and that question is, what is the place of opinion in news journalism today? And how is that changing? And how do we think that's going to affect the future of journalism, the idea of opinion? So I'd like to introduce the panelists today, beginning on uh, closest to me. It's Mike Fancher. Mike was the executive editor of the Seattle Times for 20 years. Uh, and more recently, he was a Donald W. Reynolds Fellow at the Missouri School of Journalism, uh, and uh, kindly asked me to group of people in Washington, D.C. to discuss uh, an issue he was dealing with at the time. And in 2009, he was a contributing writer to the Knight Commission on the Information Needs of Communities in a Democracy and the Aspen Institute, Institute's Forum on Communications and Society. I'm really abbreviating these guys' bios. Uh, they are so long, we could spend 30 minutes going over all the things everyone's doing. Uh, Next is Michael Huntsberger, an assistant professor of mass communications at Linfield College, uh, just up the road. Uh, specializing in electronic media, his research focuses on mass media and society, on ethics, technology, history, and Michael has an uh, extensive uh, professional career in community and public radio as a producer, manager, engineer, and consultant starting back in 1980. And then on the end, Lee Wilkins, who is a curator's teaching professor. Uh, I'm not altogether sure what that is, but <laughs> that's what she is. Carrie is a teaching professor at the University of Missouri, where she teaches in the radio TV department, and is a published media ethicist, and serves as editor of the Journal of Mass Media Ethics, my favorite journal. And again, a list of things a mile long. All these people are amazingly accomplished. Uh, so uh, I, I give you my bio, but I'm embarrassed after introducing them. Uh, but you know who I am. Uh, Tim, would you like to uh, say a word? Just welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Glad you're all here. Tim Gleason, Dean of the School of Journalism and Communication. So we're going to start this morning. I'm going to take my seat over here on the panel, and then we'll open the discussion. Uh, we should have enough time for questions, so uh, be sure that uh, you uh, hang on to those. So uh, if you have a question, ask it, and we'll do our best to respond. Okay, so what we've got going today is I uh, just kind of introduced the topic. Uh, quite a few high-profile journalists have either been fired, suspended, or resigned uh, in the last couple of years over not being able to draw a line between news and opinion. Is this a simple conflict over the role of journalists within the organization they work for, or is it a harbinger of a sea change in a uh, way that journalism, in the very way that journalism is going to be conducted? So the question we're going to address today, I'm just going to ask originally or initially each panelist to address this question and we'll work from that. Exactly what is the place of opinion in news journalism? How does that place seem to be changing? And what are the effects of that change on the perceptions of journalism's role today? So we'll get started. Uh, we can start just in order if you like. Mike, would you like to go first? Tom didn't tell us in advance exactly what the question was going to be. And that's, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's a deep question. 
It's like an old smuggler's brother. Take it, Tommy. No. The, 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 the headline that tried to get you all here was, what was it, the, uh, what's the role of fact in, a, in, a war, in the age of truth? Something like that. And it occurred to me that if you think of facts and, and opinions and journalism, you could look at it coming from two different directions. One would be uh, the role of opinion in the reporting process of journalism, and the other could be the role of facts in the editorial opinion process of journalism. And it seems to me that we're in an age where there's more opinion in the reporting and less, fewer facts in the editorializing than ever before. It seems like the wrong combination, at least from my perspective. Um, because this is in the name of John Hulting, and because I was a University of Oregon graduate in 1968, and John Hulting was, in fact, my faculty advisor, I bring with me my little Bible, the Plain and Straight book, a practical discussion of the ethical principles of the American Society of Newspaper Editors, written by John L. Hultang in 1981. And I think this is a good start. Article 4 says truth and accuracy. Good faith with the reader is the foundation of good journalism. Every effort must be made to assure that the news content is accurate, free from bias, and in context, and that all sides are presented fairly. Editorials, analytical articles, and commentary should be held to the same standards of accuracy with respect to fact as news reports. Significant errors of fact, as well as errors of omission, should be corrected promptly and prominently. You could say a lot more about that, but I don't think you necessarily need to say any more than that to, to make the fundamental point. And I guess I'll, I'll, I'll stop the opening remark just by saying I think part of what's happening to journalism today in terms of opinion is in a world of constant news, constant information, 24-7, the bombardment of information, and people having so much access to information outside the realm of journalism Journalists, it seems to me, are really trying to are scrambling to figure out what ground they can stand on. And in, and in the sort of the shouting match that is, especially broadcast media, I think increasingly they feel a tremendous pressure to have that ground be something that's provocative, that is emotional. And I don't necessarily think that that's a future that journalism can live and sustain itself. I think the future has to be much more grounded in the tradition, traditional values of fairness, accuracy, and building trust with public service and independence. <coughs> Michael? Well, uh, I'll try and build a little bit on what you said, Mike. I, I think uh, your point about a, a lack of facts and opinion and, and too much opinion in our, our reporting, I think, nails it down pretty uh, succinctly. Um, I, from my perspective, uh, I, I work on the, the uh, alternative end of public broadcasting for a long time with the Pacific Organization. And uh, if, if you don't know anything about the Pacific Organization, it was founded in the, in the post-war years in the Bay Area by a group of idealists who really took to heart uh, a, a lot of the European philosophy that we, we've studied when we get into uh, media ethics and just human ethics generally. Um, so and it, it's ironic that uh, this group of people who felt themselves dedicated to truth may have set a path for uh, a point of view or, or opinion-based journalism that we have seen play out now over 50 years. Um, uh, I, I think that what we've seen, as, as Mike pointed out, is uh, the veil has been lifted, the curtain has gone up uh, on the process of and on the process of, of ordering fact and, and providing news. Uh, in an environment where there were few channels, where we had, uh, uh, you know, where, where we had newspapers that were voices of authority in communities, where we had three networks, where we had uh, a limited number of radio stations in any community, uh, people didn't have the kind of access to order facts in their own way that they have now. Through the internet, uh, and and so I think that's part of it. But I think Mike is also correct that in that environment, uh, the business of journalism has to work much much harder to sustain itself economically, and that means finding and holding an audience, and that means that the primary obligation now of the journalist becomes building and holding that audience not necessarily digging 
deeply and thoroughly into the facts of a story. Um, uh, this is not to say that, that uh, you know, any individual journalist is, is beholden to, you know, particular advertisers, but they do work for media companies that have to make a profit. Right? And, and if there is no audience for that program, be it, uh, you know, top of the hour news or a talk radio program, or a radio documentary. If there is no audience, there is no service, and the, the entire the entire enterprise disappears. So, uh, I, I think this collision of uh, a, a vast amount of information that is directly available to the public, and the very powerful pressures of capitalism on on uh, the process of journalism is this is a very difficult environment to navigate if you are the person who is trying to uh, report a story in a manner that uh, that uh, lives up to the, the principles and the practices of, of Mike cited. Uh, it's just a very challenging time. Lee? I have a couple of thank yous to say because John Holting was one of my teachers too, so it's really kind of special to be asked back. Um, in this context, and also to Professor Vibbins for asking and funding and all that other sort of good stuff. So enough with that. Okay, so Tom, your question, the answer is yes. Oh, okay, good. Do you want me to say Are more? Are we done? Moving right along. Uh, Questions? Uh, <laughs> I know we can't um, say more. I want to say, I want to say a couple of, of, of things. One of them is, is a little bit abstract, and, and the others are pretty down and dirty practical about the kind of journalism that I see my students doing and that I know that they are fascinated with and that I actually think is, is pretty wonderful in, in a lot of ways. So first for the abstract part, um, James Carey, not the actor, the scholar, um, is famous for saying that there's no such thing as a fact without context. I think journalists have understood this for a very long time, but our audiences have not. And what we're tussling over is in many senses not the facts themselves, although I think there's some tussle over that, but the context in which those facts will be interpreted. And I think that's part of the talk radio scene. It's part of a lot of a lot of other a lot of other things that are that are going on. So this is a place where context matters. The second thing is that I think that in some ways we as a profession have lost a little bit of our moral spine. Uh, we supposedly learned way back in the McCarthy era that when a person of any sort, but usually a public official, got up in a place in West Virginia and held up a page and said, I have here a list of 206 people in the State Department who are members of the Communist Party, that it was not our job to reprint that statement without first checking it out. I think we've forgotten that. I think we lack as news journalists, the moral courage to say, such and such is a lie, so and so is a liar, and then to provide the space in our news organizations to do that. The person who does it, and does it well, and is the person I know all the students here watch, is John Stewart, who is absolutely unafraid to say, so and so lied when they told you this. Part of being a journalist, okay, and I know lie sounds like it's an opinion, and I think we are afraid of it because, oh, lying can't be interjected. No, there are ways to demonstrate if someone is lying to you. And what you have to do is to lay out the evidence and then make your case. Um, it really genuinely <laughs> disturbs me that I can look at John Stewart and see better in-depth coverage of some things in politics than I can find on the front page of the New York Times or in the Washington Post. That's a problem that we, as a profession, are having. And I think it speaks to a lack of courage, not just individually, but certainly among our news organizations. So, the abstract. The second thing that's happening is that I think that the folks in the back of the room, namely the students, are doing some inventing of kinds of journalism. So I'm going to use two examples. The first is blogs. And the second is documentaries, and I mean both audio and visual documentaries. Um, I work with a lady named Jen Rees who has a blog called Born Just Right, 
Those of you who've got your computers out, you can Google that name and you'll pull it up. That block was developed after her daughter, Jordan, a wonderful young woman, was um, born a little bit unexpectedly with only with one limb partially underdeveloped. She had had her umbilical cord wrapped around her in, in utero. And so Jen, as any parent would, embarked on this wonderful saga of how do you get first an infant and then a toddler and now a five-year-old a prosthesis and the sort of medical services that a kid like that needs to be born just right. In the process of doing that, she developed a blog. That blog has about 3,000 unique followers. Those of you who know those statistics know that that blog is absolutely monetizable with those kinds of demographics. It is abashedly full of opinion. Um, Jen is an advocate for the disability community. She is an advocate for her daughter. And her blog is filled with facts. It's a kind of journalism, because I would argue that her blog is very journalistic, that I think you folks in the room are going to invent more and more of. The reason I think it's as accepted as it is is because it's really hard to find a lobby for people who think that infants should be born with incompletely developed limbs. It's easy to find a lobby, at least in the state of Missouri, that says that there should be no social services for that group. So, fact, context, opinion. The second thing I'm going to talk about is documentaries, because I don't know about folks at U of O, I haven't been here in a while, but my students at the University of Missouri are completely fascinated and energized by the notion of doing documentary and what we call point of view journalism. Now, point of view journalism has a really long and distinguished history, but what it means now is that if you watch something like Morning to Brothels, you see the journalist actually becoming a part of that story, and you are able to evaluate motive as well as a lot of other things. I think journalism from a point of view, whether it's Iraglass on NPR, or you know, award-winning um, things like uh, just, just one on ProPublica, with the cooperation of NPR and ProPublica, is you're seeing a lot of journalism that is now being done from a point of view that is both analytic and critical and at various levels kind of transparent. That's the sort of opinion in journalism that I actually welcome because, to tie it back, I'm tired, unbelievably tired, of journalism as stenography, where just because somebody says something we think that it should be the newscast or be the headline in the New York Times. That's our, that's our professional issue, and we need to change it. Thank you. Um, the, the, the name of this today, as Mike mentioned, was uh, Fact and Views, Truthiness, and I think all of, most all of us are aware that the word truthiness was invented by Stephen Colbert. Uh, his last name was really pronounced Colbert, but that's where they decided on it. Um, in any event, uh, and it, it roughly means something that looks like it ought to be true, uh, but doesn't exactly. It sounds like it should be true. Uh, I can make you think it's true, but it's not exactly true. Uh, to quote another uh, uh, fictional character, well, actually Stephen Colbert is a fictional character. Uh, to quote another fictional character on uh, a long-running series, Boston Legal, Denny Crane once said, there's no such thing as fact anymore, just good and bad fiction. So I'd like to, uh, I'd like to uh, take on the notion of uh, opinion versus not so much fact, but the kind of, uh, uh, some people are thinking, old-fashioned idea of objectivity and the news, uh, which really began full force probably following the 1920s. Uh, and has become kind of an accepted way to do journalism uh, objectively. Uh, some people also point out that the no, a lack of objectivity doesn't necessarily mean bias either. And that's what a lot of people are afraid of. If we lose the idea, or the ideal of objectivity, does that mean we'll end up with nothing but bias and opinion in the news? Well, all you have to do is read uh, the newspapers in the UK uh, to understand that that's not necessarily true. So uh, I'd like to ask the panelists, what's their take on something like that idea 
Uh, is objectivity an outmoded notion? Is it a, an evolving notion? Uh, is it something that we can still use, and if so, how? And we can take this in any order. We don't have to do it. Anybody, anybody who wants to grab on to this? OK, so I'll start. Um, I have at least three definitions of objectivity, one of which is the one that I was taught in journalism school, which is kind of that detached eyeball that hangs around up here and sees 360 degrees, doesn't think, doesn't feel, just observes. I never thought that that was a good starter. I use objectivity in terms of process. If I'm objective in the process of collecting fact and opinion and analysis and context, if I'm willing to be persuaded by what it is that I find and learn, if I can unveil to you, as it will, the making of a sausage, if I have an, a process that is objective, even though process doesn't predetermine outcome, you can have great process and crappy outcome, and we can all think of times when that has happened. Objectivity as a process actually still has a lot of legs for me. The 360-degree detached eyeball, not so much. And so I'll stop and let us jump in. and I were just talking before this about a, a friend and an ethics professor, um, Stephen Ward, who's written a book called The Invention of uh, sure. Journalism. Mm -hmm. And he has an interesting examination of why objectivity never really did live up to its, uh, its reputation in terms of the role it played in journalism. But he also talks about something that he describes as pragmatic objectivity, which is sort of this testing where you do the process that, that uh, Lee is describing. I, I think that we will re-examine the notion of objectivity and move away from it as a defense for how we do what we do. And I do think that there's a very important role for transparency in this. If we are willing to say at the start whether we have an agenda, such as Jen Reeves' blog, that I, I, I am doing this because I'm passionate about it, I want to achieve a certain outcome, and I'm going to play it straight from the standpoint of the information I give you but I do have an agenda. That's one way to go about doing something that can be journalistically sound because at least it's honest with people. Um, there are other approaches, I think, that try to stay away from having an agenda and that start with the notion that the, op the, the responsibility that a journalist ought to feel is to examine the facts and put them in context, to dig deeper than facts, to weigh one set of facts against another set of facts as fairly and objectively as one can, and then to find something that approximates truth. I think that that's a course that I personally would be more comfortable with. I don't reject the other one. I just think that this is one that for for journalism organizations that that try to stay out of the agenda business, that's a that's a, a better uh, way to go uh, about that. Another way in which objectivity kind of slides by the boards is when you're trying to differentiate what's significant from what's trivial, uh, when you're trying to provide some sense to things and some navigation around how to find information. The problem that I see right now with so much of, of what's going on in the journalistic world is it's this, it, it, it shifts so quickly away from reporting and verification and, and, uh, and uh, validation of information to analysis and interpretation of what's the meaning of this. What's the impact of this going to be on the presidential campaign? And then at that point, whether you think you're a reporter or not, essentially all you're doing is offering up your point of view, and you might as well be one of those I reporters that they have tweet in and say, well, I think such and such. Because frankly, if you're not doing any reporting uh, and you don't have any great background, then your opinion is no different than any viewer who happens to weigh in. So, so personally, I think objectivity is a, 10 years from now, journalism schools will be teaching the concept of objectivity or the role of it differently than they have in the past and it will be informed by the world in which we live in which there's a lot more give and take between uh, journalists and, uh, and, the, and the audiences or the public they try to serve. You know, I don't know that I have a lot to add, especially given Mike's experience in the newsroom, uh, you know, really trying to sort these issues out. I, I do, uh, I, I want to echo uh, what Lee was saying. I, I do think objectivity as, as a sort of an overarching, you know, model for what we should be is that's never worked. Um, it's that, that kind of grand 
narrative for, for what we're doing as, as journalists and storytellers uh, is so removed from the actual process of producing the story uh, that it, it, you know, it's an interesting ideal, but uh, you know, we can only do so much to even approach that. I think objectivity as a deeply personal process is very important, and that's you know, what, what if, one of the journalist's most important qualities is to be skeptical, and you have to be skeptical first of your own work. And you have to be asking yourself, have I looked at everything? Have I weighed all of the, the evidence here? Have I consulted all the right people? Uh, do I truly feel informed on this? Right? Um, and, and that process, I think, is very important, whether we call that objectivity or we just call it reporting. Um, I, and, and I also want to uh, agree with Lee that I think the best reporting comes from somebody who has dug deeply enough into a story that they can tell it in a compelling manner, and it's because they really figured it out. And I think if you watch uh, some of the programs on the Frontline series, or if you listen to some of the, the longer reports that you'll hear on National Public Radio, uh, you, you can hear that the person who's telling you this story has lived with it for a long time and, and has really, they've looked at it from, uh, you know, a, a more distant point of view, uh, you know, examining, examining records, examining documents, and then they've also talked to individuals and, and have had their, uh, their point of view informed by very close contact with, uh, with people who've been affected by what's going on in the story. That's just good journalism. The kind of storytelling that you're talking about in, in the blog. Right? This is what the blogosphere gives us that's very rich, is the ability for people to mine deeply into a story. And yes, it probably is related to an issue, and ultimately their interest in that story probably comes from something that happened in their life. That's okay. Right? They're deeply enough inside that material that they can speak from a very well-informed point of view, and that in turn informs our consumers. So I, I agree. I think the concept of objectivity is evolving. We may throw that term out the window. But for me, it's a, it's a personal process. It, it, it certainly occurs to me if, it, in terms of what the technology allows, because a lot of the discussion around the effects of technology on journalism is the, the, the burden that it puts on journalism, the pressure that it puts on journalism, and the bad things that happen because of it. There's so many good things microscope around and see it from the other side. So there was a period during which editors were encouraging reporters to write with authority. And what that meant was leave out some of the sourcing and the, and the attribution and let the writing sing. Well, you know, readers become pretty distrustful when that writing with authority sounds like opinion. Um, in the digital world, there is the opportunity to layer and layer and layer information and to build in source documents and to let the reader, if you want to write something that is pretty definitive, say he lied, for example, then you can layer back and show the documents and show that. How do we know what we're reporting? Where did this information come? Who are our sources? What what frame of knowledge did a source have when that source spoke? Or what what uh, agenda did that source have? It just seems to me that in the, in the interactive internet world, the opportunities to do richer and deeper sourcing of the information we provide is wonderful, but we have to seize that opportunity. The other thing is the, the, the time pressure that we feel of public, you know, the people, the editor of the New York Times recently explained how they made the mistake of saying that Gabby Giffords had died. NPR said it, the New York Times said it. It was, a, it was one of the dumbest mistakes you will ever read, and I would encourage you to go read the column. But the, the reader representative made the point that it's not 24-7. It's 1,440 slash seven. There are 1,440 minutes in a day, and that's the pressure that journalists feel to write, to report, right now, right, right now, right now. Well, when I was an editor, and we had one press run, we had one decision to make. Is this story ready or is it not? And if we, if we weren't ready, we were dead for 24 hours. Well, now, if it's 503 and you're not quite sure, you can publish at 504, at 507, at 515. But that's a control that if you don't recognize you have and seize, you're likely to make some 
from Silicon State. So again, it's looking at the problem from a different point of view. And I think Mike's comment about this is where capitalism crunches journalists, because we have journalists, at least in the Midwest, who are not just reporting, they're collecting that sound, they're taking still images, they are getting video, they're doing all of that editing, they're putting it together in a converged story, and yet we have the same sort of level of professional expectations of depth and accuracy that we've always had, but we have many more chores for that individual journalist to do. And, and that's the place where, you know, you ask if, if, if we just had, you know, five more people on the staff of the New York Times, would they have been able to do enough checking to avoid that particularly rather disastrous and, and, and silly error? Um, and, and, and it is the place also where in the online world, at least, at least among some of my students, the notion is I'll publish it now and if it turns out to be wrong, I'll blow it away. And so the, the, if, I, you know, if I discover that in fact Gabby Gifford is still alive, well, I'll just blow away the report that said she was dead and, and, and that'll be all right. The problem is that with an active audience of news consumers, those are the kinds of things that news consumers tend to remember. The New York Times failed to accurately report Gabby Gifford's demise. And, and that leads to, I think, a, a distrust of, of even simple stories let alone the much more complicated ones that journalists are covering now. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the, the, the time element because I was thinking of this in your opening remarks about how, um, you know, you, you, you talked about McCarthy and, and the list and, you know, well, we've got to get that out to the public right away. And, and, and uh, you know, that's that pressure and that, that, um, that misperception that journalism is, is, is just stenography. Here's what somebody said. What do you think? And, and you know, we're not we're not going to process this. We're not going to check this. We might tell you, you know, this is unconfirmed, and and we don't we, we haven't been able. Somebody said this, and we're we're looking into it. We'll run with that for an hour until we get some more information. Um, uh, we have to be more patient than that, and and uh, and and there is the opportunity to do that now because uh, particularly in. in uh, the online universe, we have the ability to, to continually add sources and add context to our work. Uh, and, and in that sense, I think the pressure on the journalists now is, it, you know, you're not just verifying things. You have to show people what your sources are. You can take them right to those sources. You can show them the database. You can show them the government report. You can, you can put up the raw audio of your interview. You can give your consumer and, you know, th this is the reason I pulled these things out of here. Um, that's a very high uh, burden for, for a journalist to, to, be, to, to say, this is how I word things. You can, here's my evidence, you examine it. But in fact, that should be a very familiar task to all of you who are students, because that's exactly what we ask you to do in all your papers. Right? And, I, and I don't think it's unreasonable to say that becomes the standard for, for the reporting and the analysis that we give the public. I'd like, to, um, I'd like to move a little bit off the, the notion of objectivity, but I mean, that, that clearly is part of everything that we're talking about here. And, and uh, ask directly about the idea, I think, uh, uh, Lee already brought it up, she called it point of view, uh, journalism. Uh, and in Canada, they call it advocacy journalism, and other places like that, uh, which assumes that the person uh, doing the journalistic reporting uh, has an agenda. So again, to, uh, to cite the UK, if you're in the UK and you subscribe to The Guardian, you know you're going to get a liberal point of view. Uh, and you know that. But the hope is, of course, to just look at the facts, and, and that's part of the idea. And I know 20 years ago, one of my favorite historians, Christopher Lash, um, uh, who wrote a number of books, uh, wrote a, a great article uh, for the Gannett Journal at one point. In it, he was pressing for what he called a revival of the partisan press in America because he said that the current press with its, with its focus of objectivity had lost sight of what democracy was about, which was basically debating issues that were contentious uh, and debatable and allowing people to express their points of view freely, including the press. So he was calling for uh, 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 an almost re removal of what we've come to think of as objectivity, which is I, 
pretend not to have a point of view, which is different from, from Stephen Ward's uh, pragmatic objectivity, which was, I'd like to remind people, Walter Lippmann's original idea was objectivity came in the news gathering, not so much in the presentation. So given that, you can still present something that was objectively gathered with a balanced approach and then present it with a point of view. So I'd like to get your take on, on Lash's call of 20 years ago um, urging a return to a partisan press because he thought it would better serve democracy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, 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 I'll, I'll dive into that one. <laughs> having, having been in the, the non-partisan, or in the uh, very partisan press, or associated with a very partisan organization where the partisanship occasionally rips the organization apart, uh, uh, I guess the, the uh, on, on the level of, of telling stories, of explaining things to people, of, of giving people a rich insight into the world, uh, I think there's a lot to be said for uh, the, the notion that uh, we, we enrich our public debate when, when, we're, when we're clear that you know, this, is, this is my point of view or this is my take on this story. And in fact, if you're an informed consumer, you can come to understand that that's what you're getting. So it's, we're not pulling the wool over anyone's eyes here. Um, at the same time, I, I think we have plenty of evidence in the last 30 years since the end of the Fairness Doctrine that um, uh, an environment that, that encourages people to share their point of view can very easily become an environment where the debate is not civil. Right? And now we've moved away from the, the, the debate about the issues to a confrontation between characters and between personalities and between ways of telling stories, right? And, and that easily becomes deeply personal for the people who are involved. And I think that's problematic. Uh, uh, if, if we're going to, uh, you know, encourage everyone to you know, tell their version of the story and be transparent about it and insert themselves into the story uh, because that brings a, a sense of truth to those observations. And we have to give them the distance to do that and we have to let them complete their story and then we have to go back and do our own analysis. Right? But I don't think that's what we've seen in the last 30 years. I think what we have seen is um, a, a, a rush to uh, analyze uh, immediate developments, um, a, a confrontational approach between, particularly in broadcasting, between points of view, because the confrontation sells, the confrontation builds audience. Right? Uh, and, and so we have, we have replaced that reasoned and rich debate about our, our political and social world with uh, arguing. <laughs> and, and I just don't find that to be, I, I don't think that goes at, at Lash's ideal. I don't think that's what he wants to get at. Where it, it, it becomes too easy for people to get excited and get angry and to communicate that anger and, and, and get their audience riled up on that basis. And that becomes the, the substance of the program. And I, I just don't think that's valuable. I want to talk a little bit meant by his comment because as journalists we tend to define, we tend to equate democracy with elections. Um, you know, who gets elected, who holds power. So I'm going to tweak that definition the way only a political scientist would, um, which is to say that I think that is part of democracy, don't get me wrong, but I think, I think what Lash meant, and I'm pretty sure what the founders meant, is how is it that we come together as a community that that makes choices not just about politics, but about how we live our daily lives, whether you know we're, what we buy, what we eat, I mean, all of those other sorts of things. And so it, it seems to me that if you know if you're gonna peg a bar for journalism in the 21st century, a, 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 a worthy goal, if you will, that it, it seems to me that extraordinary journalism, the kind that, that we all want to aim at, is the kind that gives us insight into what it means to be a person who lives in a community, both critically and emotionally, 
So what, I'll let it, what does that mean? Let me give you two examples. Um, one piece that I think does a fabulous job of that is incredibly old. Um, it's so old that some of the students actually may not know the name of the, who the woman is. I'm going to say who wrote it. It's called I Was a Playboy Bunny. It was published in a very little known publication in 1964 by an otherwise unknown young woman reporter named Gloria Steinem. It is a fabulous tour de force of point of view journalism because she put on the bunny suit and she worked as a bunny. But in the process of doing that reporting, okay, and it was not itchy, even though the story is written in first person, you see the hours and hours and hours of interviewing and fact collecting that went on to get it. It is also and meant to be a commentary on what it was like to be a woman in the 1960s. That, to me, is journalism that helps us live in a community. It acquaints me with something that I would otherwise not know. It is the reason that I went into journalism, because journalism gave me permission to go up to people who weren't like me and ask them a bunch of nosy questions and tell other folks what they told me. And, and to me, that is still the adventure. The second example I want to give is much more recent. It's by a guy named, excuse me, Michael Ignatiev. Teaches at Harvard. But this piece is called Balkan Physics. And it was published in The Atlantic. Um, you can't find, I think, a place on Earth that is more contentious, conflict-filled, and in which the basic facts on the ground are in dispute than the Balkans. But Ignatia, hence the title Balkan Physics, but Ignatia, who is from that part of the world, introduces you to those points of views through his own eyes and, and makes you understand that world that otherwise we would, we would be unavailable to. To me, that is journalism that helps me live in a community. In this case, it's an international community. But it certainly is a community that had you know, a political outcome, and thanks to former President Clinton. My, my point of all of this is, is, that, is that I think in some ways, we as journalists don't ask enough of our journalism. We, we equate just the quick hit fact with this larger effort to make us live in a community. And I actually think that's more what Lash was driving at. Not merely voting, just the act of getting up in the morning and deciding how it is that I'm going to live my life in the most thoughtful, informed, passionate manner. That seems to me really what journalism is about. And then I want to add one other thing. The thing that most disturbs me in all of this fact in the age of truthiness is what we as journalists do about folks who refuse to be persuaded by fact. And that is a problem that troubles a lot of us. I think it troubles many of us more and more and more. Um, I live in the state of Missouri, which for those of you who don't know much about the Midwest, can be very aptly described as a big red state with a wide blue belt. And I live in the blue belt part of the state. But if I go to other parts of Missouri, things that I assume as fact, okay, and I think I have reason for that, are either unaccepted, not capable of being believed, or rejected out of hand. And I don't honestly know how journalism as a profession survives in a society where you have a substantial minority of folks who refuse to be persuaded by fact. And, and that problem really troubles me because it's the dark side of the active audience. I've, I've written a paper for the Aspen Institute that will be out in mid-June, and if there's one notion in the paper that I think is worth having written the paper, and maybe worth reading it, it's the idea that if journalism didn't exist today, we would not create it in the form in which we've practiced it for the last century. And it is so hard to get your mind around reimagining journalism for a network world. And if you think about what happened in Egypt um, when Mubarak st stepped down and Anderson Cooper was interviewing the Google marketing executive who had been so central to, to the revolution there, and Anderson Cooper said to him, well, you know, where, where is this going to happen next? Where, and, and, and what's the next country where, where there's going to be this turmoil? And the young man said, uh, 
watch Facebook. In a world where Facebook is the underpinning of a revolution, what's the role of the journal? You can't, it's not a straight line from here to answering that question. That's why I use the term reimagining. And if, if you don't reimagine journalism education, then you can't reimagine journalism. Journalism education has a wonderful opportunity because it's not wedded to a platform the way most in the industry are. <coughs> Journal, journalism educators have their own baggage, but they don't, they aren't uh, as vested in a delivery mechanism as an editor would be a newspaper editor or something like that. So the whole question of who are we teaching and what are we teaching and how do we have a better informed citizenry, this, the control is totally in the hands of the consumers of information. Um, Ken Doctor, who's an Oregon graduate and has written a book called Newsonomics and has a website that belongs to that, that name, was speaking at the University of Missouri recently, a really bright guy, and he said, um, we are the best recommenders of what is important to know. But he didn't mean we journalists, which is what, probably what he would have, would have meant 10 years ago. He meant we all of us. So we use social media to know what's important. We, we use social media and each other to know what to watch for and what to ignore. Again, in that world, what's the role of the journalist? What's the role of journalism education? I just think we're, we are so on the leading ed edge of this and it's going to be far uh, more, um, uh, the changes can be far greater than anything we can imagine. I think it has, it represents a tremendous opportunity for the spirit of journalism in, in public service. But we just have to rethink everything every step of the way and learn as we go. And recognize that we are in league with, with the public we serve with this. So if we say to somebody, here's what we know, here's what we don't know, then you also ask, how might we find this out, and what do you know that I don't know? And that's a different relationship between journalists and their no longer audiences, their, their communities now. Then you can help us, the journalists, tell these stories, and we can help you find the truth you're, you're seeking. I want to give a uh, we can keep talking, trust me. Uh, but uh, I'd like to give uh, you a chance to uh, ask any questions that you might have at this point. Questions? Thoughts? Arnold? The traditional media uh, professional organizations have had for many years codes of ethics. Do you think that those codes did something to provide benefits to the reading public and listening public on that? And if so, why don't the online news organizations today, like uh, Slate and Salon and so forth, have any sort of codes or standards which they should hold up as a guide to follow? So the question is if uh, traditional news organizations have codes of ethics, and as far as I know, they mostly all do. Uh, do online or should online uh, news outlets, or those claiming to be news outlets, why don't they uh, have similar codes of ethics? I'll, I'll pick that one, uh, at least to start, and that is to say that there is there is a, a code of ethics for bloggers uh, uh, that is uh, uh, readily available. Uh, if people want to go to that, and it, and, it, and it comes very much from uh, the SPJ code, if you read it, right? Uh, and I use that in my in my digital media class. The issue, though, is I, I think is uh, we're, we're, we're in a much more diffuse universe of, of information providers now, and uh, you know, we, we, don't, we don't have any legal definition of what the, the place of a, a blogger is. The, the prevailing wisdom is that bloggers are not journalists, and not get press privileges. And, uh, and I, I think, as, as Mike pointed out, we are really on the leading edge of this. So um, I think when you talk about uh, a publication like Slate, where you have a, a, a strong uh, journalistic mission embedded in the organization, uh, I think there's a lot of continuity with the, the codes of ethics that we've seen historically in the industry. Um, the issue becomes all of the people who have come to this who are native to online media and are using it for a, a, a whole range of purposes, right? How do we even get this information in their hands? There's, 
But uh, you know, we've talked for a long time about, you know, is journalism even a profession? There's, there's, there's no license requirement. There's no particular education requirement. Right? Anybody can say they're a journalist. Well, you know, now we've compounded that to the nth degree because anybody can be a blogger just out of their home. So, uh, I, I, and I think uh, going back to the role of journalism education, uh, this is one of the things that we really can do is introduce people to uh, those ethical standards that historically have been part of journalism and, and continue to emphasize why these are important. But our, our reach is much more limited than it was in an age when we were training newspaper reporters. But that, but that information is out there and we do make it available to students. I think ethics codes are great for beginners. Um, I think they're very helpful. I also think that ethics codes tend to be aspirational. And in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, we hung a lot of our ethics codes on this aspiration of objectivity. And I don't want to go back and repeat what's already been said here, but in, in many ways, I think we're being sort of hoisted on our own petard. We told everybody we were going to be objective, and now everybody's asking, how come you're not? Um, if we had been more thoughtful, I think it would have been, it would have been better. The last thing I, I want to say about ethics codes is that one of the things I really like about the SPJ code is that one of its four major components is be accountable. And journalists whom I know are struggling very hard with what does it mean to be accountable? To whom am I accountable? And how does accountability happen? Um, and, and, and so that's a place where this aspiration of be accountable, I think when you actually uh, operationalize it, when you make it a living part of your newsroom, it leads to doing things differently than we maybe have historically done so, which gets back to Mike's point about reimagining journalism, which I think is reimagining not just what the end product is, but also the, the process, right, of, of how we get there. And to give the consumer the information, the power to challenge back, to push back. I mean, again, we're so on the leading edge of the possibilities, but there has to be the mindset that says, I want to do this. As a journalist, I'm fallible. I'm humble enough to say, I may well be wrong, and all of you, all of you may know something I don't know. How do I tap into your knowledge in a meaningful way? That's a different spirit around journalism. Well, I'd like to, oh, yeah, go ahead, please. That's what yeah, hi. Um, my name is Scott Bond. I'm a criminology professor uh, at Small Liberal Arts College on the East Coast. But um, for more than 20 years, I worked in the advertising and media world. And uh, so I'm, I'm uh, acutely aware of the, of the pressure of uh, uh, journalists working primarily for for profit companies in a capitalist society where I mean, profit is, is, is the god, right? And, um, and the pressures that that divides it. And so my question is really just to uh, uh, sort of morality, right? Um, uh, these for-profit companies are not necessarily immoral, um, some might be, but they're certainly amoral, you know, because they're, they're for profit. And I, I recently had a situation there, there in New York, there's a, um, there's a, apparently a serial killer operating in uh, Long Island. And I was quoted in the in New York Times uh, on, on this case uh, about the, 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 the expert opinion is from knowledge. Well, a, uh, a radio host in, in Charlotte picked up on this, and she called me, called me in my office in New York, and said, um, and she had me on the air, and she said, uh, 
you know, I'm calling you here from Charlotte, and uh, we got a million people here. Isn't it possible we have a serial killer on the loose and nobody knows about it yet here in Charlotte? And it was, it was a turn I mean, it was just a frivolous fear monger. I mean, that's, that's all this was. And I found it very disturbing, you know, needless to say, because here I am now, I have to kind of talk her listeners off the edge. You know, she's just putting them on the edge, and I'm trying to talk them off the edge. And um, so, does morality fit into this anywhere? I mean, uh, what are your thoughts? Morality and capitalism are a difficult marriage. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 there, there's so much history of, of uh, the mass media, um, uh, you know, currying fear as a way to curry interest in content. Right? I, it's a very easy path. And, and uh, when the pressure is, again, to build and retain audience, when that's the first objective, right, go to, the, go to those solutions because they work, right? If you scare people, it, it, it doesn't matter if we're talking about the, you know, the, the, the levees overtopped and we're all going to get flooded or we might have a serial killer even. You know, don't mention the fact that we don't have any evidence that there's a serial killer, but we'll just mention that as a way to kind of get your blood pumping. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, I think there is a place for morality, but I think there are plenty of owners who would shout me out of the room and, and, and remind us of, of, you know, Milton Friedman's point of view that the only uh, responsibility of business is to make a profit. I think there has to be more to business than making a profit. I think you have to say, we are about making a profit for the purpose of Responsibly informing the public, and then you, you have to you have, you have to be willing to back that up with what you believe responsibly informing the public is. But I think we too often don't go anywhere near that. Unfortunately, uh, we're we're running out of time, but we'd be happy. We're going to be around. We'd be happy to to engage with you and uh, and answer your questions if you have them. I'd like to give everybody a chance to take a little break before the other panel starts. But I'd like to thank my panelists uh, for being here today and answering such interesting. We have a, uh, an, an, as you probably gathered, everyone here has at one point or another uh, graduated from the University of Oregon. Uh, some That's longer, the dirty little secret. Some, some <laughs> longer, ago than, uh, longer ago than others, including me. Uh, uh, let's take a five minute break. Please indulge. Uh, we have uh, stuff over there to eat and stick around for our next panel, uh, which will be up in five or six minutes. Thank you. This is the opportunity to say Closest well to me. She's going to moderate the panel. Lauren Breslovsky is uh, sitting next to her. Jacob Dittley over there, the man with the tie on. Uh, and uh, always with a tie on, actually. And uh, Mara Williams, one of my favorite people, down on the end. And I'll let them uh, go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for those of you willing to stick around for the grad edition of today's uh, presentation on facts in the age of truth news. Um, I will start presenting our panelists at the end with Mara Williams, who, uh, for those of you who saw the advertising beforehand, is replacing Karen Esplin today. Uh, Mara Williams. Mara Williams is a second year PhD student in communication and society through the School of Journalism and Communications at the University of Oregon. A zinester, illustrator, and former radio host, she is currently studying queer media production online. Recent projects include studies of post-feminist and post-racist logics in online fandom, queer online archives, and feminist game blogs. Um, next to her is Jacob Dittmer. Jacob is currently enrolled as a PhD student in the SOJC's doctoral program where he studies political economy and media journalism, as well as new media and culture. He is an alumni of the University of Illinois Journalism Program, which he converted into a stint as a reporter and editor for several regional publications. Jacob is, has additional interests in media policy and politics, where the public interest is emphasized but hardly defined. Next to Jacob is Lauren Brotlowski. Um, he's a PhD student in the School of Journalism and Communications. Before coming to Oregon, Lauren was the communications director and web editor for a nonprofit, and then an AmeriCorps VISTA at the Cincinnati Public Access Station and Local Media Center. She has been at UO for four years now and studied a range of subjects from The Daily Show and New, Cynic New Cynicism to Satire and Dirty Rock. Her current research interests are sort of centered around television history and archives. And I am Stacey Tucker, um, also a graduate student at SOJC here at UO. I worked for over 10 years in online management, web design and development in various industries, including newspapers, film, and education. My research interests include gender and expressions in the media, 
course of virtual environments, social and independent media. Uh, the way the panel's going to go is we have four questions we're going to ask, and two panelists each are going to respond to those. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with the title of the panel. Our first question, can we handle the truth? Um, and answering that will be Lauren and Jacob, and we'll start with Lauren. Oh, thank you very much, Stacey. Um, looking at one guy in the sphere of politics, 
uh, we see how truth can change from one opinion to another, and it can be, it's out of the control now of the opinions. The guy that started with one version of truth and then negated that with another version of truth, and now it's out there for people to use in their own way. So, yeah, Jim? Well, uh, I haven't actually been following the New Gingrich story other than his awesome tweets, which I know are well read by everyone in this room. Uh, he's very important. Uh, but in terms of kind of the Daily Show, Colbert truthing his uh, sort of rubric that we're working in here today, uh, I think it's interesting to sort of think about um, the role that humor plays in sort of providing an avenue to truth in the form of satire that uh, Lauren is mentioning as sort of this old form of uh, information transmission that inverts, plays with people's roles, but in that process, we're still getting sort of a way to the truth, right? Um, old old uh, Bakhtin, if anyone here knows who that guy is, he wrote about uh, the carnival and how the jester used to, um, that was the one moment where the jester used to invert the power structure and make fun of the king. And uh, otherwise, if you ever made fun of the king, you would off with his head. But during the carnival moment, that was the one moment where you could actually kind of make fun of the king's size and things like that. And so satire has this long history of sort of shining a light on truth, or at least maybe presenting some sort of truth to the people. Um, also, in terms of the, the Daily Show Colbert uh, form of truth that they present in the, in the humor and the satire and the parody, uh, I think it's interesting to think about the, the second reference to James Carey today. Uh, news is a drama or a ritual in that you know that there's sort of this play that's being performed in the in the presentation of information and that we're all sort of part of that when we consume it and I think that um, Stuart and Colbert are really sort of playing with this notion and they're really drawing it out as opposed to the sort of sterile uh, expectation of what the news is they are saying this is performance especially when we start looking at the way these uh, <coughs> sorts of press events are arranged, the way information is transmitted, the way certain words are used over and over. So I think it's interesting to think about that sort of ritual being toyed with in, in their fashion, and the way they sort of um, paired it. And uh, in particular, you know, I started thinking, even I sort of kept going down that line of thinking and, and how they are actually very similar to journalists in that they collect information from sources, which are usually the media themselves, and then they sort of pick it apart and they plug in little pieces out of context often to make a point to sort of you know show this is what happened this is this is how it played out and boy can you believe it um, so I think it's interesting to think about how maybe these two individuals although they wouldn't define themselves as journalists they are employing the very tools of journalism in their practice and uh, I think that that's kind of the point of this whole conversation in terms of um, humor is truth and truthiness is and actually not too far from some sort of journalistic standard that I think uh, they're definitely playing with. So I just wanted to make a point on that. Our second question um, is, before and since 9-11 and the advent of the internet, the media has played a large role and benefited from systematic fear, which has resulted from world events, evolution in the economy, and lifestyle. Please respond to claims that the media participates in creating panic, moral, emotional, and or economic as we endure the growing pain
I think a really valuable framework for looking at how this occurs in media is the concept of a moral panic. A moral panic has occurred when a condition, episode, person, or group of persons emerge to become defined as a threat to societal values and interests. And today you see moral panics in the headlines in terms of cyberbullying, in terms of memes, in terms of social networks, in terms of video games, and of course, politicians, religious leaders, edit um, editors, and educators are quick to take up arms against these things. <coughs> Unfortunately, in the case of many moral panics, the facts simply don't support the panic. For example, in the case of video games, a real causal relationship has been drawn between violent video games and acts of violence among our youth. And in fact, violence among youth have gone down in years since some of the video game industry's most violent titles have been released. Today, in terms of moral panics, I often see a tendency on the part of mass media to adopt an idea of technological determinism. So the idea that it's technology that's determining our culture and our cultural and societal values. So it is because of cell phones and texting that hormonal kids experimenting with their sexuality do so in unwise ways. And it is because of the popularity of minds that People that 20 year olds are engaging in ridiculously dangerous behavior on apartment balconies leading to their death, which is the case in Australia recently. Um, the Australian Prime Minister recently called to an end of planking, um, which is this internet craze where people take pictures of themselves face down like boards in really unusual and stupid places. Um, and a 20 year old Australian attempted to do this, fell to his death recently. Um, it is because of video games that depressed and confused teenage boys are to school with sometimes tragic results. And it is because of social networking that adolescents struggling with identity issues and peer validation are horribly cruel to one another. Sorry. <laughs> um, I understand the appeal of technological determinism. I understand the appeal of moral panics because with them come simple solutions and they become popular stories, and it makes it very easy for policy makers to try to le legislate solutions to these problems. And it is far easier to believe that technology is the problem for all of these issues, and to create moral panics around these would be a sense of bringing on the audience, and as a panelist in the last session said, to get our blood <coughs> pumping, than it is to really do the research and weave through what in reality are all of the causes of society. The same society which paved the way for the adoption of all these um, so this kind of qualifies as an rant, a rant, so I'll end up with a prescriptive note. Um, to challenge journalists and mass media to avoid the tendency toward technological determinism and cultural inclinations to participate in moral panics and simplify the challenges facing the work is known to Mark. Well, thanks for the setup, because you we're, we're kind of tackling this in two different ways. And so when you did the, the sort of the history of technological determinism and some of the ways it's been talked about in terms of these are the, the problem is in the thing, um, I'm thinking about it more in terms of the context of my own research, which is on the emotional dimensions of online debate um, and how these moral panics tap into emotional conversations and emotional ways of being that can, can incense us, right? It can get the blood pumping. But it also, um, I think one of the things to, to keep in mind when we're talking about the ethics, especially in, like I said, my work's on online stuff. So we have the same, we literally have the same examples of blanking and sexting and these kind of, but these current moral panics, you can take it back to other moral panics as well. But the idea um, that's really, I think, at the center of the idea of the moral panic is the narrative of protection, right? And so it's about who gets to protect and who gets to be protected. And often it is white heterosexual children who get to be protected. Sometimes gay children, if they're lucky, um, get to be protected as well. But, and I'm being a little um, polemic there uh, because I, I feel like it's a space to, to kind of to push against what might be at stake with a moral panic or with the, that narrative of moral panic. Um, the other thing is thinking about, so who gets to do the protecting and the ways that a narrative of moral panic puts uh, journalists, it puts I mean, knowledge producers of all kinds, uh, and I'll include social scientists 
in, in who are doing the uh, effects research trying to find that link between video games and violence or between um, you know, sexual violence and sexting or things like that. But for, for knowledge producers, it's nice to be in, in the position of protecting people. Like that's ethically, we might feel called and be responsible for that. But I think we also have to complicate the idea and take into account, especially when we're talking about adolescents, when we're talking about people who, who maybe not don't have access to the same um, corridors of power that journalists, that knowledge producers, that, that university professors have, that, that it's also about who counts as human and who gets to make the decisions about their own bodies and about their own written communications, about their performances, right? And so, in, especially, this you know, becomes very clear in online spaces when the, and, and, it's, and it's a hard place to be to, to argue for this, this space where people can make bad decisions. But people can make bad decisions, and the idea that, that uh, the online space is something that should be feared and that is out of control and that you need to be protected from doesn't, I think, take into account the full humanity of people who are using it in very specific ways and in very specific contexts to create and craft communities that meet them where they are and that do things for them or that allow certain performances or certain identities to come into being in ways that, that may not be accessible outside. Um, and so, well, there's a lot of problematic behavior that gets enabled by online technology, there's also a lot of really positive behavior that, that can happen and a lot of connections that can be made in, that, um, in those spaces. Um, so I think when we're talking about moral panics, the, the main thing that I want to add to this conversation is to think about the emotion and about the rationality and thinking about who gets to be a rational subject, who gets to make the decisions, and what's at stake when we make decisions when we make, um, when, we're, when, we're, when we're put in that position of, of making those claims on behalf of others, um, how does that hook into larger conversations about power and about historical ways of understanding who gets to be protected and who doesn't, who's outside of the realm of the human or the realm, the realm of protection? For our third question today, how can the news media fulfill its responsibility to report facts and truth with complex environments such as the Middle East and topics such as the collapse of financial markets? Um, and Jacob and Lauren, you're going to respond to this, and I'll start with Jacob. Okay. Um, well, this kind of works a little bit off of what Mara was just suggesting about sort of who gets represented, who has a voice in these sorts of environments that we're talking about. And uh, in particular, I was going to talk a little bit about some research I did in my, in my master's thesis on um, the Iraq War and the framing of conflicts there, in particular uh, the, the insurgency as we came to know it and the arrive and how that word sort of came to be used as the, uh, the sweeping generalization for a very complex environment. And in particular, just to back up a little, if we can remember the good old days of 2003, uh, <laughs> um, you might recall that there was, there was a real concerted effort to sort of present information uh, in a very streamlined fashion. Um, in fact, I was speaking with Michael last night about this, that some of the people in the administration were very uh, oriented towards selling the war and the effort, uh, sort of marketing logic in terms of presenting information. Um, so in, in that regard, uh, you know, my research was born out of a question that had a lot to do with Abu Ghraib and how um, very few people referred to it as torture in the U.S. media. Um, always prisoner abuse or uh, abuse scandal. Uh, these sorts of words became the salient texts that we came to associate with it in the U.S. media. Um, so I started to do a little bit more research on this in, in utilizing framing theory, which explores how certain information is presented and made more salient to uh, the reader. Um, you know, I looked at why is this insurgency word used and how did it get sort of propagated and um, accepted by the public and the media itself. And you know, I started to think a lot about how the relationship that exists between journalists in a war zone and the military, right? So the insurgency frame, if you think about it, was the truth, the fact of the situation for the US military, which was the individuals that the journalists were speaking with by and large. 
So it, it, it's not as though they weren't presenting the truth, they were just presenting a truth that was from a nationalistic, militaristic perspective that maybe we as consumers weren't aware of or didn't consider full, uh, wholeheartedly. So, uh, I, I, you know, it gets to the question of sort of how ideology can become sort of inherent in these words and these texts. And, you know, sometimes we don't necessarily think about that when we're consuming the particular news media. And then that sort of gets to uh, this current moment that I think is really interesting. I was speaking to Stacy about this just a little bit ago, and I'm really curious about this word, the Arab Spring, which is now being bandied about to describe the, the revolutions. And I don't, I don't know if this is actually coming from the individuals themselves, but a spring, you know, connotes good things, right? It's, it's all about democracy. It's not about uprising. And I sort of made the quip that, you know, I'm sure that the leaders in Syria don't consider it a spring. They probably consider it an insurgency. So it's interesting to think about the, the words that are selected and chosen in the news media in this particular context that we're talking about and, and how these complex environments are what we are interested in. They're very important to uh, the sort of dialogue that's going on in the public sphere and in the, in the government sphere. Um, and in terms of ethics, it's just interesting to think about the sort of historical roots of, again, the questions of objectivity, uh, balanced reporting. And uh, just to conclude, you know, I, I, I did sort of continue on this path of research. I think it's important to note the, the sort of shifting dynamics of, of uh, power in terms of the source journalist relationship. There was a time when the journalist possessed a whole lot of power, and now I would argue that I, that I believe the source is starting to possess the power. We, uh, we have sort of put them on pedestals, we get very excited about the access and those sorts of things, and in doing so, we are transmitting their ideology, their ideas to the public, not necessarily a sort of objective or balanced uh, reality. So. Oh, yeah, uh, great, great to see you.
and again, this is all academic, but there certainly um, have been ways to suggest how the news media can be more truthful, can be more accountable, responsible to the people that they write about, the situations they're writing about, by thinking about the words that they're saying, and thinking about, say, what angle of a photo do I include? What do I crop out? What don't I include? Um, who do I include in there? And so on. So it's words, images, context, um, all sorts of things that should be considered uh, when thinking about news responsibility. And for our first and final question, there's undeniably been increasing concentration and consolidation of media ownership, as well as shifts in media distribution and consumption, with trend changes brought on by digital networking, i.e. the internet. Discuss the impact of this on truthiness and Mara, Mara can take this first. So um, I'm going to concentrate on those, those shifts in, um, in distribution, and especially in regards to my, my research on the internet again. Um, but I think as far as like the truth goes, one of the places that I've been tracking, um, I, look at, I look at community media, right? And very specific community media. So I did some work on YouTube communities run by and for transgender individuals who were sort of using the, the, blog, the video blog format to connect with each other and to create these ethical communities that they could see each other and represent themselves in ways that they didn't see that happening in the media, uh, in the, the wider, larger mainstream media. And also, um, I look at fan communities and how they're using, again, the technology to, to form these places where they can make connections and craft and write in ways that, that are not available to them or that, that feel, and you know, it's, it's, it's a thing, it's, it's all about emotion, right? But so a lot of people talk about, when I, when I interview them, when I talk about, like, you know, why are you producing your own media? And they're like, well, because I don't feel like I have access. I don't feel like I have the ability to be represented, and so the only way to do it is to make my own. Um, and so but I think that that, that shift, right, is, you know, one, it's, it's not totally new. There always there have been people left out of mainstream media, of mainstream news production in many ways. And I don't want to don't want to steal what you're going to talk about, Stacey. So I'll keep this brief. But you know, the idea, the, the historical idea that we have a mainstream and that mainstream is neutral is is not. Um, there's a lot of challenges to that, and the ways that the mainstream gets invoked um, in political conversations is this kind of middle ground where we can have a rational conversation and what gets left out is the, is the real violences that have gone into creating the mainstream and to who's left out of that mainstream and it's usually gender minorities, racial minorities, um, class minorities, people who don't have access to the same types of language or power in those ways and so really that's kind of at the center but I also want to talk about positive things because I'm trying to shift my research towards positive Things and so thinking about changes in distribution and ch and the ways that people are actually using internet technology to create spaces for themselves and to present challenges and if you think about this in the terms of you know the history of um, communications you know this is a, a challenge to the idea of a passive audience right that and again there have been historical studies that you know the audience has, has never totally been passive but with the internet we can kind of see it happening. And so what we can do is track the ways that like fan communities create um, networks and communities that are based not on commercial um, valuing, right? That have they have an economy, but it's a gift economy, or they have an economy, but it's a it's an economy of cultural competency. And so who has the resources and who has the ability to to influence and to have the most weight in those communities is not based on access to material or to economic resources, but to this kind of um, learned cultural patterns from within the community. Um, and I think that presents a model of how, how new technology might give us a challenge and might give us a way to think about it differently. And again, going back to the video blogs, like it gives us a model of how people have created spaces for ethical seeing each other, right? Recognizing each other sort of in a face-to-face -face way that are not necessarily available if you go to the mainstream media. So I think that's one of my, my calls for us to think about is how, how people, um, and not to create a, a, a false divide between journalism and knowledge producers and people, real people, because that's 
that's not very helpful. But to think about the, the many different ways that communities are representing themselves and finding ways to see each other in very, I think, true ways. Uh, recently, Eli Pariser has received a lot of media press. Uh, he's a former executive director of MoveOn.org, and he just published a book called The Filter Bubble, What the Internet is Hiding from You, um, that nefarious internet. Uh, Google, Facebook, and Twitter have certainly transformed themselves into major, major media companies in their own right and become major distributors of news and information, perhaps the major distributor of news and information for the millennials who will likely carry those media habits as they age. Um, in this new book, Paris are warns against a cultural trend towards further further isolation and to customize information bubbles, which filter differing perspectives and viewpoints than our own. Whether these filters are the result of how we construct our social networks online or the result of algorithmic features in Google and Facebook intended to improve our experiences with our products by displaying information suited to our interests and habits. Um, Paris here is concerned that the internet is becoming too polarized, politically and otherwise, because of the features and tools used by social media. And in the spirit of my last talk, um, I would caution against being too nostalgic um, about assumptions of a healthy public sphere before the rise of online social networks. Numerous studies in media and communications pre-internet has revealed what Lazarus Development said in 1948, a tendency by the citizenry to erect high tariff walls against alien notions. Um, so perhaps what Facebook and Google are actually revealing to us is how niche the major players, such as CNN and the New York Times, actually were and perhaps always have been, that perhaps they haven't always been the sort of uniform mainstream that they thought that they were, and social media is revealing to us that they are actually really niche publications. However, I don't want to talk about that. Um, I thought it appropriate to finish today's panel by briefly addressing how this changes the work we do as media scholars and educators. Um, how do we support the assumptions we make as researchers and academics in the world of Google and Facebook? Most of the original reporting that we're consuming today is still being done by the major legacy media organizations who still possess the resources and the power, but bloggers and independent media are successfully reinterpreting the original reporting by the major actors, penetrating filter bubbles with their reframing of the facts. And information is being reframed yet again through the commentary that accompanies the link shares on Twitter and Facebook by members of our isolated social networks. Is how news and information framed by the original source anywhere near as important or valid a starting place for our research as it used to be? Which frame matters and are we able to analyze all of them or analyze the process of these messages as they filter down in millions of different ways? And which news producers matter? Is financial power and circulation ever still valid criteria or is morality, the success of the story to virally sh be shared throughout the interweb, uh, the new criteria? And if so, how do we Interestingly, increasingly, and interestingly, actually, the method, methods we use to analyze media framing, agenda setting, and ethics are in danger of becoming irrelevant unless they become significantly more, more complicated. And finally, how do we prepare our future journalists for the world of Facebook and Google? Um, there are debates taking place in journalism schools across the globe over how to train new generations of media producers for a media landscape that has changed dramatically in the past decade. There's obviously a great deal of focus on the new tools of the trade, digital photography, videography, web design, stylized writing for online audiences. And while the job market looks bleak for this term's graduating class, in many ways, today's journalists have more power than they've ever had, the power to instantly self-publish to a world audience. Fewer journalists are graduating into media workflows that include editors, news budgets, and hierarchies. Fewer are being passed from professors to editors, classrooms to newsrooms. There's less motivation for online publications not to publish everything written unless it's likely to draw a lawsuit. So while it remains important that young journalists know the tools of their trade, how to write, how to tell a compelling story, how to research facts, it's perhaps more important than ever that we produce independent thinkers. Perhaps more than ever, theory, history, and ethics are the most important tools we can give them. Um, and that concludes our panel, where we talk a lot uh, today. And we actually have some time left for questions, comments, and feedback. Thank you very much. I really, really enjoyed your, uh, your panel today. You hit on so many important things. Um, uh, I'm a psychologist. I have a media background. And um, uh, a lot of you talked about the uh, notion of um, uh, uh, certain groups.
those minorities not being represented. And uh, yeah, uh, interestingly, uh, or not, uh, if you look at victims of, of uh, particularly high profile murder cases, the victim is almost always an attractive young white woman, and if she's blonde, all the better. Um, almost never is it a, a person of color. You know? um, the, the, And the way that victims are represented are, are often uh, demonstrated as, um, as as very passive and often um, uh, almost blamed for their own for their own circumstances. Um, so you touched on so many things. Um, actually, and I, I wrote a book that came out last year on the moral panic concept of why the Iraq War, uh, mass deception, moral panic in the U.S. war in Iraq. And I looked at the framing um, by the Bush administration and the media of this Iraqi threat after 9/11 the extent to which it affected public opinion um, in polls leading up to the war and the willingness of the U.S. to uh, support uh, going to war. And interestingly, uh, and I didn't anticipate this, I thought that there would be a relationship between the, um, the, 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 the framing of the issue and public opinion, but what I hadn't necessarily anticipated was even the power of individual words. And um, my analysis, which took place over a three-year period, single most powerful predictor of the American public's willingness and support to go to war in Iraq was any time the administration used the word evil. And if you remember axis of evil, evil doers, mad men, weapons of mass destruction. It didn't matter who used the word. It didn't, the, the, whether it was Bush, whether it was Condoleezza Rice, Cheney, it didn't matter. Even independent, independent reporters, but it was the word evil that was the most powerful predictor of the public, public's willingness to go to war. So that gets to the power of rhetoric and the power of words do matter. So uh, uh, I applaud your work, I think, collectively. Thank you. So many awesome things you guys touched on. Thank you. Um, Lauren, <coughs> I uh, heard you talking about you, Gingrich. I want to just uh, thank you for that and also tie it into what the previous panelist was saying. He's kind of the, uh, the leader of the non-believers. Um, you know, I was always under the impression that these people just weren't educated. A lot of them are very smart people, and they just choose, they choose their truth, you know, and they're willing to just completely change one for another because of a guy that, you know, is on the radio every day bombarding them with <laughs> whatever he thinks is, is uh, important. And I also wanted to touch on that, you know, uh, blaming the, the new media for everything. How are we supporting our parents? How are our parents supporting our children? But I think that actually MySpace and Facebook have done a lot in the cause of, of helping address bullying because all of a sudden we had pictures, we had words, we have proof. Because, you know, it used to be when I was growing up, oh, my son would never do that. Well, he's that he did, but, you know, you didn't see him. And it's like, oh, it was horrible. You know, bullying went on. It was, been around for years, you know, but there was no proof. If there was no proof, you know, we saw it and everyone shut up about it and nobody told anybody, you know, but then all of a sudden there's this new media and there's proof. And you can't say my kid doesn't do that anymore. And so I think in that case, you know, we have, I, I think it's it's brought the whole conflict of bullying into the main community, mainstream community and addressed it and I'm, I'm, I'm positive. I have a question. Uh, first, have any of you seen the, uh, the Epic 2015 video that sort of mm -hmm. lays out the, so you know the- I know this, yeah, yeah. Right, okay, so at the end of that, um, the point they make is that now that we're in this uh, very technologically rich environment that makes it very easy for consumers to become producers, that at its best, what you end up with is media that's personal and immediate and, and speaks directly to people's daily lives. But much more what you get is a lot of content that's just sort of trivial and self-centered and, 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 and not meaningful, right? And uh, uh, I thought you made, your, your closing was excellent, Stacey, talking about the importance of theory, the importance of history, and, and 
particularly since, since you're younger, you're coming into this. Um, my question for the panel is, uh, historically we have depended on institutions to inform people about the theory, the history. Do you think those, in this atomized world of producers, do you think those institutions are accurate, are, are, are um, uh, enough to uh, instill people with a sense of ethical behavior, responsibility to their audiences, or do we need to build new institutions that, that can operate in this, in this more disparate medium? Um, I
also instilled the power to change those institutions. That you know, it took many years to change um, the segregated communities of the South, and they still, some of them are, but there was a power that did change that, and so there, there is a hopeful tinge to my cynic statements. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I guess, yeah, to jump on, to jump on that and add the word truth to it, since that was Woo! the title of the, uh, <laughs> the panel, um, it, you said that uh, if in the future everybody will start, con consumers will you know, produce their own knowledge of all these things and how does that then challenge institutions, it's also up to the institutions to start to accept the, the little truths, the, the, yeah, the collection of different truths coming out of this body of consumers, so that it's not just the institutions putting out one version of truth, capital T or not, but um, that then they have to give up some, some amount of control uh, if, if we're going to embrace this kind of collect, this collectivist um, way of going about things. Yeah. Well, I'd like, to, I'd like to wrap it up and uh, thank everybody who came today and thank our panelists especially. Thank the School of Journalism for sponsoring us. Thank the whole team family for, uh, for uh, 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 paying for it all. And uh, thank, I'd like to especially thank my students who stuck this out all the way through. I uh, hope it was worth it for you. Uh, thank you all. I hope to see you again. <laughs>